Thank you so much to Wayne, to Esme, to Claudia, to Ilaria, to all the people who have helped make this conference possible. Uh, yesterday was indeed a super interesting day, so let's hope it's as feisty today. Um, okay. Okay, so I'm going to begin with an object called Wirewall, asking what it might mean to put this in an ethnographic museum as a piece of American culture, or perhaps more aptly, as part of a, a global culture of incarceration. So my goal today, as prompted by our fabulous organizers, is to think about how to create a museum in which conversations about the racist and colonial violence of our world become visible, but also how this museum might create space for people to collaboratively imagine better, more caring worlds. So, Step one would be to ask, what is this object? Any idea? Can people imagine what it might be used for? If I had more than 20 minutes, I would actually open it up for you guys to respond. But um, So after asking this in the museum, we would then need to learn what this was actually designed and used for and what it reveals about a particular carceral culture uh, and ways of relating to others. So this is one of the technologies used to build a prototype of a border wall. It was among the finalists for the border wall that Trump wanted to build along the Mexican border, U.S.-Mexican border. In 2017, Trump created a competition for border wall designs. And six prototypes were erected in the desert near San Diego alongside the existing border fence. Locals made fun of him, suggesting it was ridiculous to spend billions of dollars trying to stop people from crossing. People will always cross, they said. And indeed, you can see that this is true by looking at the images um, that I took along the border wall in Brownsville, Texas. Here, you can see uh, the fingerprints along the metal beams, the traces left by many who have scaled it. Anyone who walks by can see the ladders on the ground beside the wall, along with the ropes and other paraphernalia. Border Patrol officers said they have to clear them away every day. The Border Patrol officers, or Customs and Border, CBP, Customs or Border Patrol, admitted to me, and the research collaborative with whom I went to the walls, uh, went to the wall, said that walls are simply tactical infrastructures. The goal is for them to slow people down so that they can be caught after they cross. Indeed, we found that CBP used a measurement called the border calculus, an algorithm that anticipates how quickly someone will disappear after they scale the wall. So what work do border walls actually do then? What work does this technology in particular perform? What can we learn from it? I want to suggest that walls and their prototypes manufacture and evoke a political imaginary about the world. In this case, it's about invasion. For instance, in June 2018, Trump tweeted that those trying to cross the southern border of the U.S. about the southern, uh, about those, he said, we cannot allow all of these people to invade our country. When somebody comes in, we must immediately, with no judges or court cases, bring them back to where they came from. Grammar is a little off. <laughs> He repeated this language of invasion over and over. For instance, when in 2019, a peaceful migrant caravan was moving from Mexico towards the US border, he stated, it's like an invasion. They have violently overrun the Mexican border. As speculative designers Dunn and Raby state, politics is a battle over the imagination, where the imagination can help us maintain pre-existing realities or create alternative visions, denaturalizing the real. In this case, the imagination both produces and is produced by infrastructure and design. Trump's political vision of a white supremacist United States was crystallized by border wall infrastructures, not simply by law. That is, the material designs and technologies have helped to manufacture the very idea of invasion. But there's more. If we investigate the wire wall technology, um, here, sorry. We learn more about the imaginary it embeds. As we all know, and many have argued, our artifacts always have a politics. In an interview with the designer, I learned that this wirewall technology was initially developed to trap lobsters and crabs. Then it served to keep fish in pens, and finally, to cage chickens. With its special PVC coating initially designed for the sea, it could withstand extreme environments and temperatures while maintaining visibility through the fence. It was now being proposed for humans. 
In other words, wirewall technology materializes a form of life based on divisiveness and separation. And more specifically, it works by way of techniques of dehumanization. And these include animality and racialization. The human as a conceptual category is not something natural or biologically fixed, but rather it's the work of a constant, constantly changing project of taxonomy. A metric of animality is used to exclude people from the category of humanity, but this in turn cannot be separated from race and racial classifications, which order bodies according to how animal they are. This taxonomic slippage has a longer history in the US, but as we can see from this technology, it's being solidified into material infrastructures in new ways. Wirewall treats certain people, here immigrants who are already racialized, like crabs, lobsters, or chickens to be caged and ultimately slaughtered. Wirewall shows our cult carceral culture, one which relies on imagining others, both, both racialized and non-humans, as fundamentally threatening. This kind of transfer of technology from non-human to human, not only likening people to animals but treating them as such, is already built into the history of other caging technologies like barbed wire. Barbed wire was initially developed to control and close cattle by inflicting pain on them in the American Southwest during the period of colonization. From there, it was transformed into the primary technology of controlling space for people, enabling the concentration camps used during the Nazi regime, the the Russian gulag, and it continues to this day as a key tool to contain human beings in an ever-growing carceral world. This photo is actually taken from the border um, between Morocco and Spain at Ceuta. So it's a mix, actually, of wire wall and barbed wire. So maybe we could put a piece of barbed wire alongside the wire wall in the museum to tell this story. In terms of immigration, this transfer of non-human to human first happened at the Organ Pipe Cactus National Monument where perhaps not accidentally, Trump kickstarted his incarnation of the wall in the last months of his presidency with a 30 mile long, 30 foot tall steel fence that has upended a portion of the landscape, its ecologies and its water sources. In fact, the US-Mexico border wall was initiated in Monument Park in 1949 with the justification of keeping out contaminated Mexican livestock, Mexican livestock infected with hoof and mouth disease. But it quickly morphed into and built on a desire to keep out Mexican people. Indeed, this is just one instance of practices of quarantine as practices of containment, not unlike bordering, shifting from microbes and animals to people. Immigrants are regularly compared to other invasive entities like pests and swarms. And in fact, the language of invasive others is used in overlapping ways for insects, pathogens, plants, and even ideas with varying results. Calling plants or animals invasive justifies extermination to protect the natives. We can see the same response being invoked to deal with invasive humans. Trump's words in reference to immigrants are once again revealing, and I quote, these aren't people. They are animals, and we are taking them out of the country at a level and a rate that has never happened before. When migrants are likened to forms of parasitic, pathogenic, or insect life capable, capable of infection and contamination, there are mandated responses, first and foremost, which, uh, of which is cleansing or elimination. We must remember, this is only one way to live in the world, where people wall themselves off from all else, trying to privilege a few at the expense of the many. This exploits and ignores the billions of life forms with which we share the planet, animal, microbial, mineral, vegetable. So the second step in helping to create a museum, or in this case, my own exhibit, um, in which conversations about the racist and colonial violence of our world become visible, would be to think about how people not only live these technologies, which include, of course, the histories of imprisonment, suffering, and death, but if and how they challenge this imaginary. Here I want to give some examples of what artists and activists are already doing to counter border wall technology. And these could also be in the exhibit. So I think of these examples as forms of counterpolitics or anti-politics, forms of oppositional politics, politics aimed at resisting, inverting, or countering the existing political order. The forms of counterpolitics I trace here respond directly to borders and to border walls by erasing or bypassing them, challenging or reimagining them. And as such, they allow us to see that borders and walls are not fixed, natural, or inevitable. They enable and encourage us to imagine forms of freedom of movement. 
Here, migrants get transformed from invasive to simply people on the move, a term claimed by these people themselves to get away from legal categories built on exclusion and hierarchy, like refugee, asylum seeker, or economic immigrant. To start, there are artists all over the world engaging in rethinking re and reworking border walls. And here, this is a, uh, an image from the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei, who instituted uh, huge metal, uh, gold metal cages resembling security fences in various locations in New York City. This was in 2017, um, along with many other smaller sculptures and fences to make people in New York City actually encounter and feel the proliferation of fences. This is Mexican artist Ana Teresa Fernandez, who created a performance called Erasing the Border um, by painting a section of the border wall blue, the color of the sky, and making it disappear into the horizon. The French artist J.R. took a photograph of, the, of a toddler, blew it up, and pasted it onto a special scaffolding where the toddler peer, peered over the border wall into California, just south of San Diego. Seen from the American side, it reveals the wall as incomprehensible to a child and hence denaturalizes it. There's so many more examples by different artists at different border walls. And here you can see the, um, uh, the this is Banksy at the Israel-Palestine apartheid wall um, on the Palestine uh, side, of course. Um, there are many, many. But it's impossible to rethink borders without engaging with the technologies also that mark, spatialize, and patrol them, particularly today with expanding digitalized systems of border control. Dubbed smart borders, these forms of militarized surveillance are located both around the wall, embedded in the walls, and well into the interior of, of many countries. Um, and they enable and require new forms of technology for from integrated fixed towers to surveillance drones, cell phone tracking towers, license plate tracking devices, there's all kinds of stuff. So while across Europe and the US, smart borders are categorized as more humane than border walls insofar as they're purported to be engaged in deterrence and therefore less directly violent, they have nevertheless increased the number of migrant deaths by shifting migrant routes into more dangerous terrain and proliferated the surveillance uh, of those within national borders. And I think here, Jason De Leon's work has shown this very powerfully. But rather than simply condemning such technologies, I want to point to the way they're being imaginatively repurposed by designers and activists, constitu constituting another powerful counterpolitics that makes these technologies enable rather than curtail people in their pursuits. They can help people move, they can help people stay. Ricardo Dominguez's transborder immigrant tool is an early example of such a counter technology. It was a mobile phone technology that provided poetry to immigrants crossing the border and simultaneously led them to water. Swedish Iranian designer Mahmoud Keshavart's uh, project on designing fake passports and reclaiming smuggling as a liberatory politics is part of this very same counter politics of mobility. Design can be a form of power turned on itself. Indeed, to this end, Keshavarts and the larger design collective of which he is a part have written a manifesto for decolonizing design. Finally, oh, sorry, I, I missed this. This was part of the technologies. I, they, I went to a border uh, technology expo where people sell <laughs> and talk about all their border, border technologies. And so this was taken there. This is the Israeli company Elbit Systems. So you can see, detect, track, classify, and eliminate. So this is the uh, final example here of a wall being repurposed towards different ends. It's a proposal for a utopian anti-wall made by the MAID Collective, which calls for the creation of OTRA Nation, a half Mexican, half US co-nation with shared infrastructure and a border-long hyperloop transportation system. Indeed, insofar as it imagines a future and tries to bring it into being, it's not so different from Trump's vision, uh, Trump's proposed border wall. As counter-political imaginaries, ideas that invert hegemonic visions of the world, they demonstrate once again that politics is a struggle for the imagination. The museum should be a space that cultivates and encourages such visions. Okay, so if wirewall technology reveals the ways in which people live simultaneously in fear of others, and as if they can and must dominate other humans and non-humans alike, the third step in this exhibit would be to ask how we might live together otherwise. While we need ways to subvert the current political order, and that's what step number two was, we also need a different set of political imaginations, new visions about how we might live and be 
be together, visions that begin to redirect our imagination beyond this cartography. I'd like to think of these as alter imaginaries or forms of alter politics, which are alternatives that are not currently, sorry, are not connected by straight lines to futures or pasts. They're alternative modes of thinking and inhabiting the world. They often exist in the interstices of our worlds. As Hassan Haj explains, alter politics work to open up space for radical otherness in our midst, trying to evade capture by existing political assemblages by creating a space beyond opposition or critique. So if number two is counter politics, these are alter politics, which is slightly different. So rather than fighting or killing or caging each other, I would suggest that we think about alter politics through the lens and practice of care, as this conference has asked us to do. We can think of care as a method of and for alter politics. When I speak of care, I, I do not mean the dominant liberal forms of political care, such as welfare and humanitarianism, which I have spent a lot of time critiquing, but rather reworked versions of care, where it's at once um, an, uh, an affective state, a form of practice, and an ethico-political obligation. While located in the mundane and everyday, in this triptych form, care may actually have a different sort of revolutionary transformative potential. As we've already heard from Wayne in many of the presentations yesterday, increasingly scholars, anti-racist activists, and black and transnational feminists are reclaiming its power in more speculative forms. So I join this interest in renewed and emerging forms of material, materially grounded care insofar as I argue that they are co-constitutive of a new set of political formations. Indeed, one of the activists engaged in sanctuary work, and this is I see as part of the larger network of no borders um, and no border movements, she stated that she thought of the project of sanctuary as the embedded collective action of care, where care is about spurring the imagination and training for the not yet. Stated otherwise, care is one of the methods you'd use to imagine, prefigure, and enact alternative ways of being together and recognizing our interrelatedness in a fundamentally non-exclusionary, non-sentimental manner. So I've written elsewhere about a decolonial feminist commons as one of these political formations, and I'd be happy to talk about it in the discussion. Care can help to bring new collective subjects into being. In this vision, care is about a set of relational arrangements, not a set of moral dispositions. It's also necessarily non-innocent. That is, it moves away from liberal goals of purity and deservingness. To care requires admitting to and managing forms of violence, not trying to evict it, expunge it, cage it, or expel it. We all live in the wake of violent histories. We're all shaped by them. Um, and implicated by them, even if we're differently situated in relation to them. To claim innocence is a liberal aspiration. Caring and killing can be intertwined. For example, people kill uh, or deactivate viruses, they eat plants and animals, and they burn forests to maintain them. Care is not necessarily clean. To, be, to care is to be attuned to relationships and to place, constantly improvising, to be willing to imagine otherwise, to deal with messiness and contamination. Thinking with care, then, how might we rethink forms of being? So I want to just briefly mention one collaborative experiment I engaged in to reimagine borders and togetherness in the spirit of creating space for other forms of imagination in this new museum. In thinking and talking about how we might be attuned to each other in the world, rather than walling it off, we ended up, and this is me and a group of others, including a bunch of designers, speculative designers, we ended up drawing on the microbiome as a site from which to imagine a world to be, a near future world, not a utopic one, and we called this biomia. The microbiome is the study of microorganisms and microbial communities that we harbor in our gut and actually maintain us as humans. We used to think that we had a self-enclosed biology, that humans were made up of uniquely human cells, which in turn determine and define us. But in fact, the micro, uh, microbiome science has shown that the human is not a unitary entity, but a dynamic and interactive community of human and microbial ce cells. I think as Claudia said yesterday, a full half of our cells, it seems, are microbial. And these microbial communities are shared across human bodies. That is, our microbiomes are not fully individualized, but shaped by our local environments, making the boundaries of each of our bodies more ambiguous. So it could be, I could be half identical to someone who grew up down the street from me. 
Microbial communities are active in ways that have not properly captured our attention. After all, these shape who we are, inform decisions we make, what we desire, how we feel. The brain functions that underpin our personality and cognition are molded by the microbiome. The self is a product of complex social interactions between human cells and a multitude of microbial cells. So in this sense, it behooves us to care about us or them, to learn to feel them or us. It requires the cultivation of a very different sensorium, attentive to gut feelings at a whole new level. If, as Rancière states, politics is about reconfiguring the fabric of sensory experience, then this is an essentially political act. If we follow this new imaginary, we understand that no system of control can master the borders of our bodies as we're always changing with our environments. More specifically, we're not separate from, but a part of our environments. As Julie Livingston writes, or so aptly notes, the body is a tentacular relationship where the air we breathe and exhale eventually gets inhaled by somebody else, somewhere else, where the water that goes through our bodies to keep us alive may nourish a farmer's field. So in a series of workshops on what became Biomia, and here I am showing an image that... Um, that was designed by the artist who listened to us as we talked. Uh, we use the theory of, micro, of the microbiome as a jump-off point to help imagine different ways of being together, not contingent upon borders, closure, identities, or fixity. We replace the concept of citizenship with an interconnected freedom to hover, to land, or to remain in movement. This was a way to think about how to be in the world and allow people to thrive and flourish according to and acknowledging that they are part of a larger multi-species relationship. Are people at ease? Do they feel like they can flourish? Do they feel good in their gut ultimately? This is metaphorical, but also physical. It's a way to understand and allow for choices about where to be and live without falling back on developing borders or fixed identity criteria for membership. Each person, as a set of ecologies, decides where they want to be as part of their larger multi-species ecological reality. And this reality is constantly changing depending on who or what is there and who or what is a part of it. Could we use this to expand our political and moral grammars? If tolerance, benevolence, sympathy, and pity dominate the effective regime of the liberal and modern era, what would the lens of the microbiome bring to our affective and social vocabularies? Would we seek to be parasitic, symbiotic, infected, contaminated by joy? The moral valences of each would need to be reconsidered. Indigestion could be a way to explain not a physical state, but a dis-ease with a political or social situation. Would we aim for uncertainty and discomfort, which might better reflect an attunement to the world? Would equilibrium be a fleeting state of pleasure, gradually replaced by an appreciation of disequilibrium when our political subjectivities are remade. This imaginary does not propose a territory of belonging, but a state of constant becoming, a commitment to exploring and embracing the lively, liveliness of the world, knowing that liveliness always includes risk and possible violence. Being open to encounter can also kill. I would hope a new form of museum could cultivate a caring sensibility for all walks of life, risks and all, and offer the space to collectively imagine otherwise. Thank you. So my thanks, Wayne, um, and to everyone who's organized this. This has really been absolutely remarkable, and. Um, Wow, that was fantastic. Um, that was really remarkable. Time is short, and I know we want to save as much opportunity as possible for discussion. So I thought I'd begin by naming just one assumption I'd like to, wor to work from. The planetary crisis of climate change we are facing does not come from a historical nowhere. It comes from distinct material histories of the colony and the post-colony. If that's my starting point, it comes, however, with a recognition that to identify these historical origins of our planetary moment is not adequate to the challenge of our times. It is just an opening to a following and urgent set of questions. Among them, for me at least, these. If it is the case that we come to the planetary present from the post-colony's historical shore, then how do we think not only about that historical past, which isn't in fact past, 
and the claims it makes on us, but also about our climate change planetary future, which isn't in fact future, but already arriving, and the claims that future makes on us. If the planet is in crisis because of the history of colonialism, and in deepened crisis because we are now already colonizing the future, then how are we best to entangle ourselves with that future, with its scales of time and its struggles for freedom? And perhaps most pertinent for the purposes of this convening, as we consider the daunting challenges of how to respond to those calls of historical and planetary responsibility, how might the university and the museum take on that new form of responsibility, which I understand this conference to be envisioning, the responsibility to be at once the critical interpreter and curator and art maker of the colonial and post-colonial past and present, but also of the planetary future which they have wrought. I'm just starting to think about those questions and don't have conclusive answers, but here are a few points of departure. The future, as I've already said but want, to but want to underscore, is something that we are already colonizing. The future and those who will live in it are already coming to us as an accelerated version of the colony and the post-colony, damaged and wrecked by what we do now. Even as it is already coming, that future and all those who will live in it has no legal standing, no structure of formal protection or recognition at least by the laws of sovereign nations. Instead, the future climate change planet and all those who will live in it, human and non-human, come to us as objected and disposable. Coming so, the future and all who will live in it, human and non-human, come to us like colonial subjects before imperial power. And as the future comes at us so, one of the key tasks of critical thought, therefore, one of the key critical tasks, therefore, is now for us to understand how to situate ourselves in relation to that already arriving claim of the future's subalterns, much as we have learned to situate ourselves toward history's claims and history's subalterns. As I've begun to think about those propositions, there is an enigmatic figure I've become aware of that might provide one avenue of response, the future claimant's representative, a legal character who the court appoints in mass tort claims, say in a lawsuit against an asbestos manufacturer, when the court knows that while the damage of the asbestos has already been done, some of its victims are too young to yet fully experience its violence in their bodies. So someone is appointed now to speak for them, the future claimant's representative. While recognized in bankruptcy procedures against corporations profiting from the mass use of hazardous materials, the future claimant's representative has not yet been recognized either in constitutional law or in international law. That attempt is being made across a range of legal actions worldwide, but thus far without definitive legal success. Largely, as the legal theorist Randall S. Abate has observed, because while courts have been willing to recognize that some non-human actors, primates and rivers among them, and some discrete future human subjects of particular toxins have legal standing, and so the right to be represented. The courts have not yet acknowledged the legal standing either of the planet as a whole, or of the future as a category in itself. Nevertheless, Abate argues with each incremental advance, it is no longer a matter of whether this legal revolution will occur, but only a matter of when and how. That is hopeful and to be advocated for. But if that advocacy is to succeed, it will need to rely on more than the efforts of juridical actors. It will depend on expanding a conception of the future claimant's representative into the spheres of critical practice and the arts, to the work of the university and of the museum. Before offering some thoughts on what that might entail, I would like to take a cautionary note from the legal discourse. As Frederick Tung puts it, while the figure of the future claimant's representative can be understood as providing a vehicle through which a subaltern future can speak into our present, it nevertheless requires careful scrutiny. And that, as he writes, is because, quote, the future claimant's representative is in essence an agent without a client. She or he or they is not answerable 
to her ostensible beneficiaries. Given the pressure on competing claimants to settle a contested matter, one might understandably question whether this mechanism can be expected truly to provide zealous representation for future claimants who do not choose and cannot monitor their agent. Moreover, there, the future, represent the future claimants, their losses are not vivid, but abstract and prospective, while the losses of competing living claimants are real. The apparent future beneficiaries may thus have enormous individual and collective stakes in their representative's agency, but a complete inability to ensure the faithfulness of their agent. This is chastening. As I've indicated, I am inviting us to consider our agency as this form of agency. I am asking what we might gain from considering that one of the tasks of the museum and one of the tasks of the university is to be both the past's and the future's representatives. But as I do so, I want to underline these cautions, which articulate the classic double cautions of representative agency that Edward Said brought before us in highlighting Marx's dictum from the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte as one of the key problematics of Orientalism. They cannot represent themselves. They must be represented. If the future comes before us as something we are already colonizing, something, that, something denied the ability to represent itself, then even as we imagine what it might mean to be that objected and precarious future's representatives, we will need to ask these dual questions of representation further developed by Gatri Spivak once again. From the mimetic register of representation, Spivak's Darstellung, can we find ways to make that future something other than abstract, prospective, statistically predictable? Can we apprehend it in its own vernaculars as something urgent and vivid? And turning to Spivak's political register of representation, her Vertutung, even if we can make that urgent future singular and vivid, will we, in consequence, hold ourselves faithful to being the agents of the enormous individual and collective stakes we are offering to represent? Weighing the losses of maneuver, of consumption, of freedom that the living present may need to make, will need to make, if we are to entangle the project of our freedom with and toward the freedom of a future from which we are not distant, Will we faithfully represent that living future, or discouraged by the sheer enormity of the task, will we shrug, hold our eyes down, and turn away? Will we wrap up the negotiations, the next Paris or Edinburgh summit, as practically as possible? Will we settle? With those questions and cautions in mind, a few words. I suggested earlier that the future climate change planet comes to us as something objected and disposable that the future and all who will live in it, human and non-human, come like a colonial subject before imperial power. I want to hold to that, with, but with a degree of more particularity. How so, and in what form? Where's the clicker? By initial way of answer, let me turn to Isle Weitzman's, this image here, investigations of the intersection between coloniality, race, environmental reengineering and what he calls the aridity line in the remarkable work he has pursued with the artist and photographer Fazal Sheikh in their joint investigation of the Israel-Palestine conflict shoreline. If I were to summarize their investigations, it would be by suggesting that the planetary mirroring of prior logics of colonialism, race, biopolitics, and governmentality is now proceeding under a logic of environmentality. The race line, the color line, the enemy line, the biopolitical line, the line dividing those who governmental power will currently make live or let die, is now being reconstrued and fraudulently deracialized as an environmental line, a line drawn between the green zone of flourishing cities and economies and the line of the desert, a line between sustenance and the unsustainable, a line between the productive and the arid. As Weizmann and Sheikh's work on Israel-Palestine in the Negev shows, however, Aridity is not a natural condition, it is produced. The aridity line is not inherent in nature. It is manufactured as a practice of environmentality, a practice of producing deserts or drained watersheds or desiccated rivers to cultivate farms, gardens, hyper cities and factories, pushing populations behind the drought line and then finding because they are discovered there 
in the arid zone they have putatively failed to cultivate that the people in these climate-ruined geographies, which map almost entirely onto the maps of empire and colony, lack standing as potentially productive contributors to the Green Zone, the Schengen Zone, the European cities on the northern shore of the Sahel, and the far side of the cross-Mediterranean passages, the green lawned American suburbs beyond the Rio Grande, that the people of the arid zone have no right to cross the line to the Green Zone and can be let die in the desert, the river, the Mediterranean drowning waters. That is a new grammar for an old story, a new way of policing the movement of populations, where the aridity line putatively replaces the race line while merely reinforcing it, and where environmentality becomes just the newest form of governmentality. But even as thinking the phase shift from governmentality to environmentality does not fundamentally alter our understanding of the present and its modes of power, it does have some larger consequences on our understanding of the future. For it is not only the millions of lives currently held to be without standing that the emerging logics of environmentality abandon. Under the codes of that logic, the future itself, with the atmosphere changes and soil erosion and agricultural collapse and desertification we are visiting on it, is also already living beyond the aridity line. Or to make an image of it, the future is the Negev and the Sahari and the Chihuahuan desert zones, and all the future desert poor seeking to cross the aridity we are making, as the future is also, become, is also the becoming planetary of the drowning waters of the Mediterranean and the Rio Grande and the floodplains of Pakistan, as the future is also all those seeking to passage those waters and sands and dying in their angry wash and sun heat if we do not act now which implies that if we are to learn how to be the representative claimants for those future refugees, border crossing from the future into our present organizations of power, that we must begin by building our contemporary and future commitments to a we, far beyond our current lines of green life and arid life, by opening ourselves to the widening future deserts and deepening drowning pools we are already making, which also means that if we are to be truly urgently hospitable it will depend on being hospitable both to objected life, abandoned now, and by opening our politics and economies and universities and museums to all the coming lives we are already throwing beyond the arid and drowning lines of the decades and centuries to come. Which leads me in conclusion to a body of work by the contemporary South African artist Ikshan Adams, vividly tracing a path to such an opening. The most comprehensive overview of Adam's project comes from his, comes from his 2020 shoot, 2022 show at the Art Institute of Chicago. The title of the exhibition is Desire Lines. The work shown there is striking. Born in 1982 in the, quote, so-called colored apartheid era township of Bontehavel on the Cape Flats, Adams, work with, Adams works with fibers, colored plastic beads, shards of glass and detritus collected from the climate desiccated terrain surrounding Bontehavel. He gathers throwaways from the sides of the itinerant pathways the people of Bontehavel have walked into the ground as they head between their alleys of hard brick houses and zinc and corrugated cardboard shacks and brace the hike to the taxi stands on the side of the N2 motorway that will carry them to their jobs in Cape Town. Gathering these wandering discards, Adams weaves those bits of glinting rubbish into the wool skeins of large tapestries, up to 20 to 30 feet in diameter. The names of the work resonate. One title in English is When Dust Settles, but most play up and down the register of Cape Afrikaans, the language that, like English, has separated life after life, the white, from the black and the so-called colored, but a language Adams has nevertheless held to and that his work reweaves as something more than white and dividing, as also a brown language, a language of brain mensa, merging histories together. His tapestries weave those skeins, defying an audience to exclude him or anyone from that Cape history. One tapestry is called Stoflika Urskot, Earthly Remains, another Spursne, tracking footprints, earth, footprints, dust, tracking, settling, remaining, a history and a commitment, 
We have been here for a long time. Track our footprints. You cannot deny them. Turn the earth for our remains and the beauties we have made. They are everywhere. Track our history. We will remain. We will continue to weave ourselves into what is ours and yours and everyone's. That is what we hear in his titles, in that sparkling brown Afrikaans, Adams has claimed. And then more demanding are the tapestries themselves. Viewed from a distance, they look like GIS renderings of the Earth's surface, satellite photographs of a deserted landscape shaded in greens and browns and blues like woven interpretations of Weizmann and Sheikh's Erasure Trilogy, with which they are deeply in conversation, with here or there a pattern of lines cut across the terrain, a tracework of intersecting paths that a people cut into it. Not just the recent residents of the Cape Peninsula, but further back still, the original inhabitants of these increasingly desertified spaces, the Khoisan, first indigenous minders of this place, who wrote their walkways, histories, and wonders into this terrain over a long time, resiliently furring their record into the ground of this tip of Africa. And then in Adam's tapestries, in the careful mix of all the flotsam he's woven in, there are the signs of the others the Cape has gathered. Malay, Dutch, English, Kosa, Zulu, Cantonese, Jewish exiles and emigres, Yoruba, Tswana, Shangan, Moroccan, Sikh, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, anarchist, capitalist, mine worker, union. All mixing and merging their paths and history on this landscape at the southern tip of Africa, a place where history's dust rises and settles, a place of history's remains and future, a place of history's footprints and converging paths. When dust settles, Stoflika Urskot, earthly remains, Spursne, tracking footprints. The purpose of those paths, as Adam's title for the Chicago show reveals, is desire. Apartheid constrained movement. Desire released it. Apartheid boasted. Desire won. Across his work, Adams has been plotting the paths of those meandering, intersecting lines of historical desire, close to the soil, gathering desires, abandoned things, and perfume bottles, and protea petals, and funeral notices, and rave party tack ups, and civic, gather and civic gathering notices, and quito flyers all spilt along those paths of walk desire, the people of the Cape Flats have written from apartheid to now. There is a history of policing and a theory of freedom through desire animating his weave. The policing is obvious. Apartheid and its police patrolled, arrested, imprisoned, and tortured Bontehevel for decades. Post-apartheid poverty punishes it still. The freedom as lived desire is less obvious until it becomes obvious. It has something to do with the practice of everyday life I've been needing to reconsider through spending time with Adam's work. If I can summarize it, it is this. Don't invent a whole new system from abstraction. Pay attention to what people actually do when they desire to be free. Learn again and anew the practices of everyday life, how people walk, where they pause to eat and drink and laugh and pray. Follow the desire lines of everyday life. Trace its spontaneities wandering a township, a spoor snay. Or as Adams has imagined it in another work from his show, follow the determined back and forth pace of an Oma, cooking pop, pressing the footstep memory of her life into her kitchen's linoleum flooring, day after day after day. Weave a tapestry from the example of that walked linoleum. And now do what Adams has done and pull back from all those local lines of desire and make a satellite image of them. Record Bontehevel's walks and paths of disobedient freedom and make a planetary image of them, woven into tapestry, opening their pathways beneath a set of sculpted floating dust clouds. Imagine the planet traced by countless endless of those desire lines, beginning perhaps at the southern tip of Africa, traversing the continent, walking from the Cape through Namibia, Angola, Cameroon, Niger, Guinea-Bissau, Morocco, arriving not just hungry but desiring and future imagining, animated by determined bodily life-risking commitment to freedom, continuing across all obstacles, over the Sahel, to a dinghy, risking the Mediterranean, heading to Marseille, or Bologna, or Paris, or London, or Barcelona, or Amsterdam, or Leiden. 
to remake again those cities, to remind Europe of what they and we know as the United States must also know, that we are not the centers of the world, but northern peripheries of the global south. With that in mind, think Adam's desire lines as a trace work and tapestry of that future, not just a map of the abandoned, but a map of the agents of the future, the map of the ones who will not give up on the idea of freedom, the map of the ones teaching us what it means to truly desire freedom across every line of divide, across every apartheid, across every Kalahari and Sahel and Chihuahua and Negev and Rio Grande and Mediterranean, across every line of enmity, across every line of governmentality and environmentality and aridity and drowning. Imagine that our task is not in some impossibly abstract, data-limited, or court-ordered obligation to be bureaucratically the future claimant's representatives on behalf of an abstract idea of freedom, but to understand that those future's representatives are already among us, coming toward us, urging us to walk a line of desire into a new planetary future that they are making. Are we ready to welcome them, to alter our present for them, to reimagine our universities and our museums for and with them, and in doing so, Wayne, to follow your lead from a conversation we had a few weeks ago, can we rearticulate the universities and the museum's project of restitution as not only a compensatory act for the past and an act of care for the present, but as a creative art for the future? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm really happy to unfold my um, artistic practice as an artist here um, by sharing the questions around taking care. So um, I'd like to start with my title. Um, can colonial objects become ecological participants? And if yes, then what does it mean um, like, what does this lead to their capacity for political participation? Can the climate or sun penetrate the glass ceiling of the museum, turning the frozen and captured object into vital force capable of forming new features? The suppressed body of colonial object from the southern hemisphere is a construction of the past and synthetic time of past, current, preformed future that generates a singular hegemony. The archived object in European Museum has a potential to break this dominant linear time found within them. Um, their bodies, while static, uh, but are still operable as they can metabolize the institution's um, internal ecology of stasis. With this in mind, how can we challenge the, um, how can I or we can challenge the predominant Western vision of the future that is uh, as a something that exists as prototypical oppressed residue in an archive. Our objects are able to change the future and evolve our understand, understanding of ourselves concerning allyship or living together with other landscape. My proposition is a visionary fiction um, to reposition the objects into the biosphere. It is returning scenario. Uh, this prospection consists of two turning movements. One is objects indigenous ecology, the past position, and other one is institutional ecology, the current position. Both will run bio, uh, bidirectionally with external, exterior ecology. This speculation searches for the opening of space where run by the um, others can thrive. The object, when captured in such a museum, will never die because they are encapsulated in the continuous moment of dying. It is immortal death, so other desires made of excluded or oppressed voices are not able to be born. They are stuck in deadlock of not being able to be born while the old hang on to the life immortally. This single time possesses objects and the future is inaccessible. The justification of monopolized time in the museum was caused by a uh, separation of main subject and objects. Also, the binary concept of nature 
and human incurred virus, environmental problems, and dominant structure paradigm in time. I wonder how the object can circulate be um, between these two divided realms, the suppressed, disillusioned objects in colonial museums and their particular landscape and climate condition have been ignored ever since they were, they were moved from their original climate to the vacuum of vitrine. Like other objects, they took form from their land, meaning their geographical bodies are deeply engaged with their land-specific condition. You can find the diverse climate formations of their material reality and the historical landscape in objects body, such as form, ideas, material, technique, knowledge, functions, and narratives, and even can be the mind. So the photo that you saw, the last two, uh, it's, you will see the sequentially, and this was the, my workshop um, called Tropical Object Turns. At the, it was 2019 at Frame and Frames in Amsterdam. Uh, started with this sort of continuous potential scenario where our climate gets warmer and tropical light, so the objects that come from the warm and humid climates, but they were kept in the European Museum, then overturned their current passive state of being untranslatable, particularly in relation to their ecology and climate condition. So can forms and ideas from south, the South contained within objects lead us to future adaptation for the new climate conditions? In this fictional scenario, when I use the word climate, I'm not only indicating like the actual, the Earth's climate transformation, but also metaphorically the flows of the speculative time, the division of the nature and objects, and objects dissonance of the landscape, and transforming all those can generate the waves of the latent intrinsic beings of objects. During this workshop, um, workshop the, this object re-reading and re one reading workshop, we were collaboratively performing, prototyping and storytelling the object for future habitats, all without seeing the object and without the museum's description of it. The, participa the, the participants could approach it uh, by following the movements when the choreographer shaped the object. We translated the knowledge via embodied gesture and social relations carried by these objects without preconceptions. Five objects were read by readers. One example is an object from Suriname, uh, which is integral to the ritual race ceremony. The object RV360-76049 uh, is an early 18th century rattle made of a brown painted gourd with a wooden stick put through it. As well as a bamboo, the gourd water bottle is one of the quite common sites in the Tropical uh, Museum, uh, Tropa Museum in collection. Um, gourd were, because gourd were widely cultivated in tropical and subtropical areas due to their specific function of holding and keeping water cold in warm climates. Due to this, the object was uh, used in water ritual ceremonies. It functioned as a media to connect tropical landscape to humans. The gestures of movements when perform embody the landscape and belief system that surround it. The grain of the pair of feather, the horizontal and vertical cuts, the motion of the rattle, the sculptural shape of the gourd, all of this was analyzed and formed through mime gestures. The context of material and shape presents how the climate shaped and the lens and how people used it. This imagined gesture was, um, can open the potential time space that is yet undiscovered within the object. The scope of the session was to map the object in an unusual way to produce a different understanding of it uh, from those we are familiar with. We moved the body to translate tropical objects and the um, shape of objects themselves. These movements indicate the context from where objects came, giving a possibility to experience their undescribed, absent landscape. Through this uh, process of movements, we co-created a new speculative landscape. 
remaking the current atlas of the colonial objects. It could dismantle the solid, determined institutional description and prefigured condition. At that moment, we were very deeply engaged with the object through our body and mind. Gestural research um, here, like, is of course, I, I think it's a reverse method, method that uh, differs from the academic or ethnocolonial museum's approach. Historically, there have been the particular and limited number of people who could touch the objects. The user, the collector, the colonizer, the preserver, the handler, the curator. The objects were always silently handled, analyzed by the politics of white gloves. The action of the white gloves govern and own the object that they handled and determined their hierarchical relationship and classified values. This gesture research can play a performative role that resists the privileged and become a political and other ritual action. And its process of research creates actual relationship with the object. Ultimately, it can emancipate the solid composition of colonial formation within objects by making them receptive to potential, transforming them into ecological participant. Museum or their objects are then conceptualized not as massive solid ideological building or the objects not as political apparatus, but as thing that exists differently. They can exist transparently and encourage an object into a dialogue revealing new stories, new knowledge, and potentially other ways to exist. In session two of the same workshop, prototyping a future habitat, we um, collectively prototype the object with the new, mat new materials using um, liquid clay. The object had a transparent temporal form for a few minutes due to this new material has some physical elasticity. It's Physical properties became like a water after a few minutes and had some motion to flow elsewhere, which caused the temporality in the object. And I realized it could attain an, at the end like real time during the workshop as it transformed. In this material praxis, materiality can turn the object into reality subject. The ethnographic object can then become a dynamic verb instead of an unknown noun. If only an object can exist seeing and acting for itself instead of something that has been seen and handled. There is always a solid materiality and po uh, potential liquid movements in an object. By metabolizing the object and naturalizing the oppressed condition, can the potential within it and its existence be repositioned? Can we overturn the clogged things through the flow, liquefaction, and melting powers? Can challenging time compromise the present problematic position by mediating the past and future positions? This re-existence signifies the problematic past and the meaning of its position. This remaining process is about finding a way to cross time and space and place and ultimately coexistence. For another work, uh, another work of mine titled uh, on, a possible, on a Possible Passing from the Inscription to the Body. Within this work, I look at uh, one of the um, uh, objects from the collection, the neglected uh, one of the uh, um, hair object, the neglected 18th century object labeled as unknown in the National Museum of World Culture in the Netherlands. The, the object was uh, actually human hair. It is uncertain whose hair it actually was and how it became part of the collection. In my video, the hair is intimately combed and presented in a transformed digital state using 3D rendering. Seeking to activate a new inscription to its body and engage the reciprocal involvement and its movement. Its movement. 
and, and it's um, while I comb my hair, synchronically this uprooted hair starts to grow, becoming vitalized, autonomous, then the whole object ecology start to be metabolized. There, the, this hair um, is, was fondled, touched, stroked, listened to, combed, named, even having a sound. This way of caring is at the level that seldom happens at the museum. Here you can see the, um, an open wound in the hair. The time here uh, could flow uh, transhistorically rather than as an unknown or ignored past. This was the sounds of the object. In doing so, you notice that uh, devalued human life is present in this devalued object. Here, institutional care for the culture object relates to care for people and for the cultural memories that contribute to their sense of identity. Then finally, the hair gestures might leave echoes if the passage of time flows, the solid identity and its materiality can be fluid. There is a possible passing from their inscription to their body, and then possibly to outside. My upcoming research furthers that uh, the last work, the hair project, uh, by using the digital choreography and the creation of algorithms for growing and vitalizing the objects in simulation. There is like uh, input sources for algorithm um, for the object like as follows, object size, object metabolism, object reticulation, object autonomy, entropy rate. Entropy rate indicates the total number of colonial objects in collection. Object function in warm climates. So this part is still ongoing. Uh, so the methodology will proceed together with choreographers and anthropographers through gestures as part of collective objects choreography that is 3D motion captured. Within this ongoing uh, making algorithm, each object's wave has autobiographical motion. These waves then mix, collide, and sometimes flow together and parallel with each other. When something solid becomes a malleable gesture, it transcends the physical limit of its territories. The transition to digital metamorphosis of the objects into liquid movement as the signals of resurrection and potentially remediation. The wave of object can choreograph the landscape by embodying, performing, the original landscape and applying the climate time. So I'd like to um, uh, expand a little bit more about one of the input parameters for algorithm, that is uh, reticulation. The notion of reticulation literally means a pattern or arrangement of interlacing lines resembling a net. Reticulation normally happens when metals like a silver object or silver are heated or organic object react with oxygen over a long time. There is conjunction between linked extensions that are visible on an object's body. Reticulation becomes a sign of a transition and movement, scars that can be transformed into passes like a vein, from one single object or thing to elsewhere or larger net of interconnections. The second meaning of the reticulation is a network of pipe, water pipes used in the irrigation and water supply. It can link one single thing to whole body of ecology, meaning it, may, it can be vascularized extensively. From here, I'd like to talk more about outside of objects. So, 
countering the notion of uh, vascularization of the object, I'd like to mention some part of uh, conceptual part of my upcoming project that is about making performative wet web of uh, colonial objects. Uh, before I'd like to say this project is uh, my project is this project is part of the program Pressing Matter. Uh, then from December this year, I will start this project um, at the Artist Residency Rex Academy in Amsterdam. So the mapping of map passage that connects the colonial body with ecological time by re-attaining its vitality. The existence of objects can move like a water, allowing vital matter to flow together with diverse time and state. But it couldn't happen like this because the material power of the museum resides in the containment and control of flows. They keep the system running by not allowing the exterior ecology. Water in museum is provocation. It causes anxiety and unfolds the precarious states in the space. It quenches the contemporary audience, cleansing the space to create a vacuum of objects. However, a water pipe is also a potential hidden respiratory system connecting to microcavity of glass box in the museum to outside ecology. They can make visible the socio-political, institutional, historical, and psychological design system of objects in museum and then can potentially recirculate the objects. They can open the extensive border and potential magnitude of clogged things. The wet map process will be reconciled um, the institutional ecology of the tropical objects by channeling the path of the water pipes in the infrastructure of Tropa Museum, uh, including the Royal Tropical Institute. Actually, um, until 1894, this location was a cemetery. Without realizing it, the institution was continuing the identity of the plot for death. This photo is not a map, um, map of uh, Tropa Museum, but I just quickly wanted to show like how the pipe is connecting the infrastructuring, the, the building and to the city. It shows the water pipe actually the connecting to the hospital in the center of the Rotterdam. The field research includes uh, for this project is analyzing the pipes, direction, and speed of the flows, the locational special bounder, boundless scale, lengths, and flow plan of the Tropic Museum, and the microorganisms in the water with uh, climate scientists and urban architects, the net of water passages, rain water wells, water taps, and water cellars can open the circuits of sealed objects revealing the sequence of the water path from the glass cabinet to the room in the depot, to the outside of the museum, to the canal in the city, and ultimately all the way to the ocean. And through the ocean, they can maybe possibly go back to their home. This photo is, uh, is, of, is uh, my project, the previous project, called Inside Out that I have done 2018. So I'm, um, that was, I'm using this uh, to just explain a little bit more, um, to link this, uh, my spec, like my upcoming projects. It was um, projects Inside Out that together with the two collaborators, we literally performed the water pipe that was archived in Zaraza Museum but I will not go too deep to explain about this work, but I found that it's interesting connection, my previous work as a reference. So we performed this water pipe, uh, bringing the actual, the actual objects, the water pipe outside the museum and take ferry arrived and the stuff or and where the pipe came from. But there was also uh, actually interesting hidden narratives like because um, there was a geographical, geopolitical transformation of the Zaroze region. Uh, they built a dike, 1920 to 24, to close the sea and making polder. So before they build the dike, areas were next to the sea. They are benefited historically from the colonialism and international trade. Then after closing the sea, 
they can translocate the museum from Landsmere to Anko Ankosen in 1980. And then um, this, at this, uh, my perf our performance, the pipe, performing this pipe was, um, the pipe went back to the Stavoren where they came from. In this constellation around the colonial object seen and translated by the water paths, there is a liquid interchange between the liquids of water, body, and mind of objects, and dripping of the water tap water. It will open the ultimate territorial border of the objects and can imagine unfinished sequence of objects. The presence of the pipe can potentially unpick the frozen sequence of objects. Maybe then, the liquidity of the water and embrace of the living and diverse microorganisms could also reconnect the collections and its outside reality. The water pipe can amplify, extend, and multiply the absent landscape, the absence of current time in objects. These waves, these flows, can draw the liquid constellation from history to the object, to all the bodies, and then to the ocean. This speculative wet map will be performed together with future public. So can bamboo, ceramics, gourd, parrot feathers, fruits, and shells of objects finally wet, get wet together with us? Through this embodied practice, the relationality of the objects will be unfolded and propagated. Therefore, the marginalized narration will be awoken and performed, potentially shaping another future. They become a real invited witness to reply and to discuss the interdependence of the global south and global north and might break this eternal loop. The extended ecological dimension will give renewed resilience to colonial objects with different positions and test their biodirectional passage colonial objects as interlocutors, as diplomats. This speculation might metabolize the potential ecology of cross-trans territoriality in objects, their re-existence, moving toward coexistence. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here and I want to share some thoughts that I've been having as a filmmaker. I'm a practicing filmmaker and um, I'm having many thoughts about um, both narrative, ecological narrative in film, but also more sustainable practices. And I think a lot of scholars, film scholars, often think of film as a representational medium, as a mimetic medium, so it's very much about what film represents, how it shows life, and with regards to underrepresented communities, how it shows uh, different underrepresented groups. So a lot of scholarly research into film has focused on that. Uh, or it might focus on narrative, so how does film tell stories, but obviously film is also a material and embodied practice, and that is one of the things I would like to look at today. This is the, um, or can I also do this? Yes. So I want to start with painting a little bit of the context of the environmental impact of film. There is not that much known, to be honest. Uh, there is, um, um, there was research done by UCLA in 2006 on the environmental cost of uh, film, and it was found that um, Hollywood, after the oil industry, is the most polluting industry in California. So California had research done. The government of California asked for a report by UCLA on to how polluting uh, Hollywood's practices were, and it found that after the oil industry, it was actually the most polluting industry, uh, more than aerospace or tourism or anything else. It found that an average film produced by Hollywood in 2006, so not today, and uh, we will come to that, uh, equals 188 cars being turned on for an entire year all day long. Um, 
it, uh, another key founding that it found, another key point that it was found is that um, as budgets increase, the pollution becomes worse. So the carbon footprint of film increases with the size of the budget. And we know that in the last 10 years, film budgets have increased. So it is probably more than 188 cars at, now, uh, at present. Uh, a similar report was done two years ago by the Frit British Film Institute. The British Film Institute found that British films have a carbon footprint that equals uh, the consumption of an average family in Britain during an entire year as well. So it is quite a carbon footprint intensive industry. It is quite a wasteful industry. My own first experience with this was in 2016 when I produced, or I directed my first drama film. So until then I had made films that were mostly self-shot documentaries and the carbon footprint of that is slightly different and I will come to that, like why is this different? I was working on a drama film set in an indigenous community and in Mexico City, uh, considering myself part of an indigenous community, I wanted to tell a story about migration. And we filmed for two weeks in an indigenous community. We asked for permission. Uh, we liaised with the community about what they agreed for us to do and what they didn't agree for us to do. And one thing they were very adamant uh, on was that we weren't supposed to leave any waste because this um, community was set in a um, natural res reserve and uh, waste had to be limited. And they were quite um, collaborative in the sense that they suggested things that the production crew could do to limit waste. So we consumed all our food um, in their own uh, community food center. Obviously, we paid for it. And we had a lot of um, consideration with regards to making sure we weren't bringing any plastic. So the entire crew brought, um, we brought for the entire crew uh, reusable bottles to drink water from, all those kind of things. And that was great. And then we went to Mexico City and the production um, returned to uh, practice as usual, which I was not familiar with. I had never been on a professional drama film set. And um, I witnessed how um, suddenly uh, feeding 20 to 30 people, which is an average amount of people being on set, actually it is a small amount of people. This was an independent small film with a small budget. So 20 to 30 people produce a lot of waste if they're all drinking from plastic cups, eating from plastic plates and all that kind of thing. And I suddenly realized this was common practice. This is what all film productions do. And um, it was really disheartening. It was like a wake up call, like this is the way film is produced. And it's very violent. It's very, um, yeah, it needs rethinking. So let's talk a little bit about the different elements that come into the production of waste in film. Uh, one thing that I mentioned is logistics with regards to cast and crew. Cast and crew tend to be quite large. So we had a cast and crew of an average 20 to 30 people aged each day on set. That is a small amount of people. An average film can have up to 100 on people, a number of 100 people on set. And this obviously creates um, needs for transportation, uh, heating, uh, places where people can change, so dressing rooms, and also food, so catering. And catering often uses disposable uh, cutlery plates and um, all kinds of other disposable elements. Then there is the element of cinematography. Cinematography tends to use um, lights, so there is the consumption of energy there. Another often disregarded element is that, of course, all our electronics, not just cameras, but also computers, cell phones, contain a lot of minerals that might have dubious sourcing and mining preceding it. There is no transparency on this. I mean, I looked into how Sony manufactures their um, cameras and Sony itself says like we have no information about where these minerals are coming from because we're dealing with intermediaries and that's a way to say well there's no transparency there's no transparency about where the minerals come from so the uh, materials themselves that you use might have a dubious uh, proceeding 
There is the art department, and the art department constructs sets. So for the construction of sets, you need all kinds of materials like wood. And of course, uh, questions can be raised about where the wood is sourced from, but you're always dealing with natural resources that are being used for production. Uh, the same goes for costume and makeup, and one thing that often happens is that after the production, the art department, costume and makeup just throw away everything that has been used or wasn't used. So there is really little recycling going on. Um, there's not a lot of circular economy going on yet, so a lot just goes to landfill. Um, the sound department uses batteries, so there again we have the element of lithium being sourced um, from dubious sources, and then in post-production, again, we deal with a lot of electronics and electronic materials. So just looking at the art department, where are the different realms where there might be issues that need consideration? For example, the use of timber. Is this certified timber? And even if it is certified timber, you're still using natural resources. What are you doing with the set designs after they have been used? And how large are these set designs? There's often use of styrofoam and plastic to construct sets. Uh, paint might contain toxics. And one element that uh, is particularly true for larger films is that um, natural environment might be destroyed in order to construct the sets. And then the last element is what happens with the waste after the film production has ended. For example, I was mentioning the destruction of natural environment for Apocalypse Now. Francis Ford Coppola had several acres of forest doused in gasoline to set them ablaze. And this, uh, he himself mentioned about this, this could not have been done in the United States because the environmentalists would not allow it. So this, would, this happened in Vietnam and the reason it was possible there is obviously because of neocolonial relations. Um, so I would like to look at alternative practices, practices in filmmaking that might be more caring for the environment and the people and the communities um, you're working with. And um, different approaches are, for example, limiting travel, you know, uh, for the, uh, just limiting the amount of people that are traveling or limiting the distances that are being um, traveled. Uh, alternatives might be walking to set or using public transport. This depends on the kind of equipment you're using. Film equipment can be quite large, particularly cameras and lights will be extremely large. So this is only possible if you're working with lightweight equipment. As soon as you're working with larger equipment, you will need more people and you will need more transport. A way to limit the equipment is to work with natural light. So not adding any light. This obviously has an influence on the aesthetic of the film. So it's also a question of what do we want to watch as an audience? As long as we all keep watching Marvel films, this is not going to change. Um, so limiting or avoiding the constructions on sets by filming on location. Again, if the amount of people visiting this location and filming on this location um, is very large, then you might still damage the location. So one of the alternatives there is working with a smaller crew. Again, this is only possible if equipment is lightweight and smaller, so more like a documentary approach. Sourcing costumes and props uh, in such a way that they can be returned, for example, by hiring them or borrowing them instead of having them made and then disposed of. Thinking beforehand about what can be done with the costumes and props. Can they uh, be given to charity? Can they be reused? Can they be recycled for another production? That is something that is increasingly done. So both in the United States and in the UK, there are different certificates for green productions. I think Netflix generally participates in green um, certification and one of the um, points there to um, apply for the green certification is that uh, set pieces and costumes need to be reused. So there needs to be some sort of plan on how um, material is going to be disposed of and it cannot go to landfill. So it needs to be used for future productions, for example. And as I mentioned, working with a smaller amount of people will probably reduce the environmental impact 
of filmmaking. And a very simple one, which is also generally one of the points for green productions um, in the US and in the UK is avoiding single-use plastic in, for example, catering. It's also one of the easier things to do, to be honest. Working with a smaller crew is quite complicated. Um, this is the film that um, Wayne mentioned, King Chendutsa, it's a Mishtek title, the translation is Time and the Seashell in English. It's a 13-minute experimental drama film. Um, I'm not going to show the trailer right now because I'd just rather talk and get to uh, the question session and I'll allow you to see the film during lunch or uh, by yourself on the website. It's a short film uh, that originated um, in the Mishtek region when we were visiting there and the scriptwriter Armando Bautista noticed in his community that a lot of smaller fauna and flora were disappearing. So lizards, frogs, fireflies, insects that he used to see in his childhood were no longer present in the landscape. And the same was true for different plants such as wild potatoes and wild mushrooms that he used to collect when he was a child. He could no longer find them. And he started wondering whether this was the consequence of drought. No, the region has become increasingly dry, there is less rain every year, and there are more wildfires taking place. And the question is, is this the consequence of climate change? We did not really go into that, but he decided he wanted to write pieces of text, so poetry relating to um, this phenomenon, to the fact that the landscape was obviously changing, that it has changed since his childhood until now. And he said, well, shouldn't we make a film about this? I said, well, that sounds great, but we should do that in a way that is appropriate to the topic. If we're worried about climate change, then the film should be caring for the environment or at least try to limit its footprint. We were already in Mexico, so we did travel from Europe to Mexico. We did not travel to make the film. We traveled to visit family and to screen a previous film that we had made the one about migration, to communities in the region. So we decided to make the film at the different locations that we were visiting to screen this film, avoiding any additional travel. As he was talking about how the landscape was changing, I was thinking about how this relates to time and to different kinds of changes in the landscape, some man-made and some that were happening previously to human intervention. So I wanted to also discuss time in the film in some manner. And the seashell um, is a symbol that is used in pre-colonial Maya writing to express the number zero, but also to express um, a general concept of calendar and therefore a more abstract concept of time. And therefore I decided to work with this seashell. Um, the story is quite abstract in the sense that it is a man recalling his childhood and um, there is an interweaving of a young boy listening to the sounds of the shell and a grown man listening to those same sounds, hopefully creating the sense that it's the same person. Uh, they are not the same person, they are father and son, which was another element that interested me. I was interested in working with different generations, so um, we also included another person who was the grandfather of the boy or the father of the grown man. In terms of production approach, it was a one-person crew, so it was just myself uh, doing all the filming. It's not great, to be honest, filming by yourself. I, I don't know if I really recommend it, um, but it was a one-person crew. Uh, we shot on location, and we shot on locations, as I mentioned, that we were visiting anyway, thus trying to avoid uh, additional travel. It was completely shot with natural light, and it was shot with second-hand equipment. So I um, had the opportunity to work with a digital Bolex, which is an experimental camera that is no longer in production, but that was made with um, off-the-shelf pieces and therefore with a lot of um, recycled materials. And the camera allows the use of old cinema Bolex lenses. So I bought some old cinema Bolex lenses really we're talking about 60s and 70s here, so very old vintage lenses that have no other real use um, to film the film with. 
So it was really an attempt to try to also work with sustainable materials in um, terms of the equipment. That is the hardest part. It is actually virtually impossible to work with material in film that is sustainable. It's not really possible. These are some of the images I was interested in lines and in exploring blurred representations to explore how representation is something that is complex and that we might want to think about. Um, as I mentioned, there is uh, the presence of a younger boy and a grown man. I'm trying to create the idea. You see in those both images, they repeat themselves. I'm trying to create the idea that they're the same person, but in a different time. But in reality, they are father and son. Um, I was also exploring lines in cinema, different kinds of lights, uh, lines of light, lines of shadow, light in the water. Um, also, again, to think about representation and the limits of representation and representation as reflection um, as well. This is the older man that uh, appears towards the end of the film, and he's the grandfather of the boy, father of the man. As mentioned, the entire film is uh, mishtek spoken and with English or Spanish or other subtitles. This project has brought me to a new project. Um, it's a feature drama film, 70 minutes, I was wondering. And I can't answer yet if this is working out because I'm still working on the project. Uh, I was wondering, can I use the same approaches, the same production approaches to make a longer piece of work? And I was interested in science fiction for different reasons. One of the reasons being that it is one of the genres that is incredibly polluting because, because it's fantasy, you need to construct a lot. So can I film on location for a science fiction film? So it's again shot with natural light. It's shot on location. All props and costumes are being sourced from charity shops and are being returned after use to charity shops. We are walking to location and using incidental public transport. And the crew is again small, two to three people, um, not only myself, but still a small crew. We're filming in Edinburgh to limit travel, so I live in Edinburgh, and we're filming an indigenous film in Edinburgh, which I think is very exciting. I'm still wondering if that's possible at all. I'm doing that with an indigenous cast, actress Alejandra Herrera, and the scriptwriter Armando Bautista, who also appears in the film. Alejandra did travel from Mexico, but she didn't travel to us, per se, she was in Paris attending an acting workshop, and I asked her to come over from Paris to Edinburgh. So we sort of combined travel again. Um, I'm not filming in the landscape uh, of an indigenous community. I'm filming in Scotland. But again, I have an interest in landscape. I have an interest in reflection, and I have an interest in natural uh, elements. Uh, one additional point is that we're working in Leith, which is a specific neighborhood in Edinburgh, which is said to be flooded in the next 30 years due to rising seas and climate change. So that's also the presence of the sea there for this reason. And that was my presentation. Yeah, thank you uh, very much for these wonderful uh, talks and, and sharing your uh, generous speculative thinking. And um, listening to all four presentations, I was mostly amazed by how much they were in conversation with one another. Um, and so I do not have maybe that much of a question, but it's more an invitation for uh, uh, some of the speakers to really articulate those conversations in a conversation with each other. Um, so. Yeah, so uh, in, the, in the presentations of uh, Miriam and, um, and Adam, uh, well, some of the common themes were like walls, and, and, and I was wondering if you can talk a bit further about the walls that you're talking about, Miriam, and the, and the museum walls, and uh, how thinking with water and thinking with the microbiome, uh, yeah, connect. Um, yeah, also in, yeah, and, and uh, thinking with water and also the, the climates and ecologies of objects uh, that Adam uh, mentioned. Um, then for the other two speakers, I was wondering, so what would the 
future claimant representative in the in the context of film production uh, concretely look like? Uh, well, how, what could that be? Maybe you can think together about that. And then I was also wondering, do we also need a future claimant representative for film? <laughs> what is what is there about film that we maybe want to um, protect or uh, keep safe? Um, and a line through all your talks was, I think, around, to me at least, um, uh, about conceptualization, conceptualization of time and also what different conceptualizations of time make of what and who can be our contemporaries. And I was wondering if you could uh, share some thoughts around that. So, sorry, it's a lot, but uh, maybe that's just a sign of how uh, stimulating your talks were. <laughs> Thanks. All right, thank you. Miriam, you want to begin? Sure, thank you. Is this working? It yes. should start working. Okay, right. great. Um, thank you for both of those fabulous questions. And I, I agree, I loved um, everybody's presentations and I felt they were really in dialogue. I also was thinking about the relationship uh, between borders in time and in space, so, and also the relationship between mobility and temporality and how they sometimes weren't parallel um, and sometimes were not. Like I think for Ian's, um, you know, the future is in the present in some sense. It doesn't require mobility or a movement. And Aram's obviously, both of yours I think are, are about mobility and uh, temporality moving together. But you know, I, so I think there are different overlaps and so on um, in relation to things that we think of as similar. In fact, they're not, right? Um, I, I think it's good to parse the mobility and the temporality. So in, in um, to respond to this idea of belonging and becoming, which is very much also about movements in time and movements in space, um, to me, one of the biggest things, the problems with nation states and with borders is this idea of fixed identity and who can fit and who doesn't. Um, and I think that has led to such immense violence, right? And is still leading to immense violence. I think nation states should be abolished. <laughs> and so um, that doesn't mean that people shouldn't be able to stay in place if they want to stay in place. But I think a hovering... Um, uh, illustrates the idea that one can move, that one doesn't have to move, right? you know, that you can move. Um, you don't have to stay in place in order to feel part of that place, I think. Um, so yes, the constant becoming is to, uh, is to be attuned to kind of movement always in space, I guess, that, that's part of it. Um, you know, as, as, as just uh, kind of more personal, as somebody who is a mixed background, uh, you know, identity claims in those where are difficult, you know, because then you, you, you never belong anywhere. And so I feel like, you know, in a world that is increasingly mixed of all kinds, um, I think we do have to make space for forms of constant becoming. I also think that um, the getting stuck in place, um, is a recipe for violence, I think. Um, people get too too invested in, in certain realities. I think we should all be able to move. It's really uncomfortable, but I think that's why I really, I'm interested in discomfort and really, um, I mean, I guess part, partly staying with the trouble with uh, you know, Donna Haraway or something like that, but it, it is about like constantly cultivating a political subjectivity that is about discomfort. Um, um, and I'll, I'll just quickly, uh, I love this question of walls and museums and, and, uh, and, and the question, I, uh, Aram's work about water and fluidity and liquidation. Um, I love that, I think that's exactly right. Again, in the kind of spirit of becoming, walls should be constantly becoming too, in some senses. I don't mean that you, d you don't ever have separations or forms of, of quarantine, as we know with kind of viruses and so on, that you can have forms of quarantine. The problem is when they get fixed, right? And, when you, and they put up borders between certain kind of types and natural kind, and make them become natural kinds. So I think a, a permeable kind of museum wall, <laughs> one that can dissolve and turn into a waterfall would be great, you know, one that could be open to other kinds of, of forms of becoming and being. Ian? Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Um, those were absolutely fantastic. So first of all, just thank you to, to these final panelists for these talks. Um, I'll try to walk through these pretty um, quickly. In terms of temporalities, um, Maybe the relationship between temporality and the idea of the future claimant representative. Um, I might let you talk about future claimants representative for, for film because you have the expertise there. 
my time is spent um, now, primar I'm primarily a university administrator, and I have to apologize for that, but sort of 95% <laughs> of my time is I'm an administrator. Um, so I'm the provost of my university, uh, and I know that that's a terrible thing, but someone has to do it. Um, so when I think about the relationship between temporality and the work of the university and the idea of the future claimants representative, um, I try as best I can really to think about what might it mean as someone who has a responsibility for, among other things, budgetary planning for university to take that seriously. Um, and to think about um, who is it that the university represents and across which different time scales does it operate. Um, and at the heart of that, for me, because of the particular history of the university um, where I work, so I work at the University of Virginia. Um, and if you know uh, two things about the University of Virginia, um, it would be that we are in Charlottesville, um, where in 2017, a group of white supremacists rallied um, and assaulted the university and assaulted the city and killed a young woman. And the other thing that you might know is that the university um, for centuries has taken as its point of pride that it was founded by Thomas Jefferson and has called itself for many years Thomas Jefferson's University. Um, and so to be in that place with those two sort of punctal points, right, a point of origin, a point of recent history, um, has meant for me um, that I, I have to think about, as we all do, but I have to think about particularly for my university, um, who it represents and across which scales of time. And who, who, who is it a university for as a public institution? Um, and so very briefly, if it, is the, if it is a university that is connected to Thomas Jefferson, which it is, then it is also Sally Hemings University. And for those of you who know that, American history, we have to begin there. Um, and then at our aspirational best, um, we are the university that um, uh, can take inspiration from the opening words of the Declaration we hold these truths to be self-evident that all are created equal. So the word we and who we are has become for me the central task of the university to understand who our we is and who we represent. And we have to have a responsibility to the historical past. We have to have a responsibility to our contemporary present. Um, but this work has made me think about what our responsibility is toward a planetary future. So there's, there's more to be said, but, but I try to think the, the, the role of the university in that way, and, and, and then maybe it's a sort of a secondary thing. Um, th this, this piece really is, is very new. I, I really rarely think as a scholar anymore. Um, uh, it follows on from a, a recent <coughs> piece of work that I was able to complete that tried to think about the time scales of the Anthropocene and to imagine that there are at least six of those. Um, the time of the individual, still human life, the time of polities and societies, the time of the species life of the human, the time of the zoological life of all life, uh, the geological life of the planet, and cosmological life in the dual sense of the cosmological. Uh, our planet is but one among others within the universe, and then going back to some of the talks yesterday, really thinking about the relationship between the time of human and non-human history and the time of the gods. Um, and so, um, uh, at a very basic level, maybe I'll end with this, at a practical level, what do we spend money on? And as you've thought about filmmaking as a practice, universities are also material practices. Among others, they are practices of light. And I was really struck um, by your work on light and maybe just waiting to return to you. Museums are practices of light. And as you were speaking, I was looking at the light in the room mm -hmm. and, and thinking about um, what a care for the future might be um, of a museum of natural light. So I'll, I'll just pause there. <coughs> Adam, yeah. Uh, hello. Um, in relation to the questions of the walls and museum, I don't have a really like clear um, answer for it. But I think what I was. Uh, Focusing on was like uh, as I said in my presentation, the objects they are time of integrum. Like they're the mo they're the, the moment of the dying. They're not 
died, but they are the, in the moment of the dying. And then I think that's uh, in that sense, I, that's how, how I've, I think as an artist, uh, why I'm interested in um, to look at the colonial objects and then oppressed object in the museum, um, because somehow in that sense, the museums, they are uh, the prototype of the future. And they are almost, uh, I mean, prototype of the preformed future that uh, is suggesting how the history is continued and the future will be, will not gonna be changed. And I think um, in in relation to the walls, I, I, how I see, um, I'd like to link to the wall. It's more in relation to the the time um, that is preformed, that is already formed uh, by certain um, very uh, the Western hegemony, and then. And then um, how the, the objects in the museums and the museum itself, that they are supporting <laughs> the ideas of the preformed time. Um, is this working or should I? Yeah, try again. Is this better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yes, the question about the future of film. Uh, there, there are there are many questions there. One question is what stories are we telling and uh, who is telling them and who is watching those films <coughs> and how. Then there is another question regarding, um, let's say the preservation of film, <coughs> which is quite complicated in a way because analog film has withstand the test of time. It has been around for a hundred years now, but we have moved to digital. And in the last 10 years, I have had to continuously update formats because first it was um, Betacam and then it was uh, Hi8 and then it was, so you continually, continuously keep copying some format to another format and now for the last five years it has been a digital cinema package but you never know if that's going to last and it's contained on hard drives and then what is the life expectancy of a hard drive and again what do you do with a hard drive once it's no longer usable, is it then just discarded and thrown away? So although a lot of people think that digital avoids questions around waste and uh, materials, it obviously is still stored in some sort of material form, so that needs thinking in both terms of waste production, but also terms of how to keep film safe, because that is becoming increasingly an issue amongst film curators, which I'm not, so I don't really know the answers there, but I know that it is a question and it is an issue. And then in terms of what film can preserve for a future, I'm particularly interested because I'm always working with an indigenous script writer who writes in his own language, Mishtek. Um, I'm always interested in what can film do for the preservation of a language that has an uncertain future and how can film contribute to imagining a future for this language. So the new project that I'm making is a film set in the future where Mishtek is still spoken. Now the truth is that uh, Mishtek is one of the 68 languages, um, indigenous languages spoken in Mexico and those languages in the last 200 years have uh, radically diminished in the sense that it's uh, assumed by the National Institute of Statistics in Mexico <coughs> that 200 years ago, 65% of the population <coughs> spoke an indigenous language and today that number is down to 6%. So in the last 200 years, there has been a very, very radical diminishing of the speakers of this language. And to be honest, I don't speak the language. My mother does, but I don't. Mm -hmm. I am a passive. <laughs> I know something, enough to know where the translation goes when I'm subtitling, but that's about it. So I'm very interested in, and there is a term for this, um, a concept, indigenous futurisms, which is looking in um, different media, not just film, but also uh, creative writing, art, and scholarly research as how can we imagine a future for indigenous subjects, a future that is free of colonization, <coughs> and that is also climate just that is in harmony with other species and with the planet. So I think that is one of the ways that I imagine film can contribute to imagining alternative future. Right, thank you. 
I, I want to do, um, Peter, come to you. So from the back, you, key is Adrian, yeah? Next you, and then Peter, all right? So Yuki first. And forgive me that I don't know your name. Please let me know your name when you're asking. It's fine. Thank you. Testing, um, I just wanted to make a comment, given that, um, you know, this, this conference is about, uh, you know, uh, group of museums and exhibition makers in the audience, right? Um, and um, the comment is really alluded to the last speaker about the, the kind of waste that is created in the, in the film industry. So I come from Samoa, it's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and then we have our public library, and we have, uh, in our public library, we have all these stands uh, that what it looks like uh, were our exhibition stands that are actually, um, uh, has all these texts in Spanish about the Spanish colonization. And um, so these exhibition stands about Spanish colonization doesn't actually come with English translation. So in Samoa, our first language is our Samoan and our second language is English and uh, uh, the, the two languages are, are taught bilingually in schools. Um, and then so uh, I spoke to the librarian about like how these exhibition stands about Spanish colonization ended up in a public library. Um, and then so apparently uh, they were offered uh, up to the public library and then because our public library is really broke and we have like our resources, um, the our public library were very thankful that uh, we would receive such, uh, such uh, resource material to educate our, our young people. Um, so when we talk about care, we also need to, you know, as exhibition makers and people in the creative industry, but particularly to exhibition makers, is to think about the afterlife of exhibitions once we do make these display stands and on foam boards and things like that. And then think that you're actually going to do us a favor by sending your exhibition stands to, up to the Pacific Islands like Samoa and then think that we're gonna benefit from it when we can't even like read the text because none of, you know, no, no, hardly anybody in Samoa like, uh, you know, read Spanish. Um, and then so um, I'm gonna take that a little bit further. So the, our public health system, we don't have enough like, you know, sophisticated public health system. And then so like the French government will like give us, um, you know, all these sophisticated like medical equipments, you know, like, you know, for whatever sorts of things, but they're coming like French instructions. You know, so I just wanted to kind of, you know, since this conference is about taking care, like we also have to care about post and how you discard it. And then who's gonna benefit from it afterwards and not think like we'll give it to like a, a developing country because they need the resources when we don't know, we don't really know what to do with it. But at the same time, we're really grateful because we don't have those kinds of educational resources, but it doesn't do jack for us. So that's just a comment. Thank no, you. It's, 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 it's wonderful, Yuki. Um, and I, I, as I say, your comments always hit that knife edge um, there is an exhibition of ours that's opening tomorrow, actually, on, on, on plastic and try to think through the global history, how would we think of plastic. Plastic as a dream material in the beginning and now plastic as a nightmare. But a part of that was to try to design an exhibition that was polluted less. And we tried as much as we could. Uh, you, you're going to see that in the exhibition, but then they also displayed the amount of plastic packaging that comes with this trying to create a non-plastic exhibition, it's unbelievable. <laughs> One stack of, so there is something about that complex thing and in, in your, 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 the second important part of your comment, which is something that haunts us as well, is also the, develop, the developmentalism that animates our international museological relationships, including the restitution debate that we're, we're going back to restitution with the same kind of logic of we need to help their capacity, mobilizing the same language. So how do we move away from those developmentalisms that, that clouds the possibility of real kind of relational futures? But I want to come back to the word, word futures later on after the question, so Adrian.
Hi, uh, thank you all very much for these presentations. And I'm happy that my question comes right after one about resource redistribution, um, because that's where I would like to go. Um, Dr. Jansen, your, your talk made me think about, um, as well, the unequal envir environmental impacts of stories preserved in film um, due to storage resources and climate change, especially in the so-called global south. Um, so a lot of research that I do in the Caribbean, for example, um, was once filmed. Uh, the, the materials I want to research were, were once filmed, but um, the films have since decayed or have, um, have been lost due to flooding, um, acid, so on and so forth. Um, and then I, I also kind of want to put that in dialogue with the fact that Dr. Baucom, um the exhibition that you highlighted of um, Ikshan Adams, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that, um, is in a posh exhibition space in Chicago. Um, and that's, of course, where the money is for shows. Um, and so I just wanted to ask what it means that this is where we, we look, um, that this is, this is where the resources are to preserve things that we can see, um, especially the, I mean, I, yeah. And, and, and I want to ask what visions you might have for redressing some of these inequalities of visions and preservations that your presentations actually really beautifully displayed, um, and whether you have any ideas for, for thinking a bit differently. So thank you. All right, can, can we do something by just taking the other question and then bring them together? And your name, please, if you can. Hello. Um, hi, I'm Nandini. Hi, Nandini. Yeah. Well, I want to start with a general comment, and it's probably mostly directed perhaps at the first two speakers. I'm not really sure. So most of us here are curators and colleagues from various European museums. And I'm not really sure how this kind of highly abstracted, um, overly self-conscious, at times narcissistic, and at times nonsensical kind of language, who is it really serving in this workshop? And I'm not <laughs> sure this is really uh, helping us get to get anywhere with the discussion. Well, I, I, I would like to I would like to first do something as yeah. a generosity to my colleagues who I've invited from afar, but I, I do not appreciate the way you structure that language because I understand what you're trying to say, mm. but I don't know that describing it as nonsensical is caring, which is the kind of philosophy let's, that we uh, let's would go like back to caring. And I think yeah. care also includes uh, creating access for the, a large number of people. I, I understand that, but what I'm yeah. saying to you is that I'd prefer if we were to articulate it differently for people who you've invited. So right. your point is, the question is, how do we translate what seems to be abstract to you and to some others to a more pragmatic approach to the museological, to the curators, and to right. publics? That is the question. Right. OK. Thank you for the no, question. No, I, I want to continue. Uh, but in the second presentation, I just, just wanted, wanted you to ask you to elaborate on your title, What is the Museum For? Because that would interest me. All right, Very brilliant. Much. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Yes. And you can answer or not. Yes, it's under you. Um, I think the first question was about how um, the production of knowledge and also artistic practice often takes place in the center or in Europe, or in the North, or in any case, not in the Global South. That is, of course, not entirely true, in the sense that there are many, um, well, again, in the case of indigenous practice, there are many indigenous filmmakers making indigenous films, screening them in indigenous communities. Um, they rarely travel outside of those communities. So again, that was a question that I have as a filmmaker like whose stories are being told, um, who is telling them, and also who is listening in a way. Because if you look at the big centers of filmmaking, things like Cannes or Venice or Sundance, 
then you do see films by Alfonso Cuaron, who is Mexican, living in first London and then the US, um, and not belonging to an indigenous community himself, making a film inspired by his indigenous nanny, uh, which is a very big problem in Mexico, that a lot of indigenous peoples are forced for economic reasons to migrate to Mexico City to work there uh, in something that is really a condition of servitude where there is low pay or no pay at all. So, um, and this is an important story and I'm happy it's being told, but I do have questions about why Cuaron is telling it and why it's being watched in Venice. And although the film then traveled back to Mexico to be shown in indigenous communities, um, that amount of care has not been displayed for indigenous productions of many indigenous filmmakers um, in um, the Southern Hemisphere. So um, I guess that one of the relationships with institutions, with whether it's universities or museum or film festivals, is to try to create more reciprocal relationships where there is care towards the showing and preserving and distributing of uh, these kinds of materials. But that's just a thought. Yeah, anybody else? Um, thanks for all of these. I'll try to go through them um, quickly. And I, and I do appreciate the question and, and look forward to responding to it. But I'll just start with the others and, and then loop back. Um, the storage question, um, uh, one of the pieces that is striking me increasing the relationship between storage and climate um, Within the US, uh, the federal government just passed, um, there was a federal regulation which was a very positive one about open scholarship. Um, but there's a relation between storage and climate and open scholarship, um, which I think that we need to think through. So the regulation is now that um, all research um, across all fields that has received any kind of federal funding um, beginning in 2025 needs to be published in an open access journal, um, which is a a wonderful thing for the democratization of knowledge. At the same time, it comes with no stipulations on how much data needs to be preserved and for how long. Um, and so libraries, um, uh, universities, museums, anywhere where knowledge is being produced are now facing a massive expansion of a mandate for data storage in the interest of the democratization of knowledge um, that is gonna come with um, potentially overwhelming um, electrical storage costs and implications for the climate. Uh, and that's just sort of one of those loops in terms of trying to put people in conversation. And it might have some relationship to thinking about, say, the work that Miriam and, and I do and the kind of the languages that we use in trying to think about across languages, right? So the language of climate and the language of open society and, and the language of, um, uh, of storage. Um, the great question on the, um, the um, uh, Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, and in fact, I first became aware of um, Adam's work because it was exhibited at the Venice Biennale. And I became aware of it because there was a review uh, of the Biennale in the New York Times, and I thought, oh, this just looks fabulous. And I was gonna be there, um, and I saw it, and, and that's, that's where it's shown. There was a great comment yesterday in one of the panels, uh, Daniela, um, I was talking about a, a new form of plunder. Uh, I, I don't have a good answer. I'm, I just think you're observing something that's important to observe, and sometimes the observation um, is the invitation to think. Uh, I'll say to the extent to which I, I have tried to think about that, and, and again, this is very much somewhat as a scholar and, and somewhat in my administrative work and, and getting to your point, is the importance of building consortial relationships between institutions and really thinking about um, resource commons uh, and not doing it uh, innocently. Uh, as you say, recognizing that we inhabit the aftermath of forms of capital violence um, that have stored excess resources in global northern uh, universities, but those need to be understood as common resources. And so building consortial relationships with institutions across the global north and the global south, uh, the global east, um, I think is, is one response to that. Um, on the, um, it, you know, I'll, I'll say, um, you know, like um, opaque language. Um, I mean, I think the language that you use is sometimes opaque. Um, and sometimes it can be opaque for its own sake. Uh, and I think whenever that happens, it's important to call it out. Um, but I also believe in difficulty. Um, and, and I think I believe in difficulty. I believe that um, art objects can be difficult. And works of architecture can be difficult. And understanding an urban landscape can be difficult. 
and sometimes the language that we use is difficult. Um, and one of the values that I, that I see in difficulty is it, it forces you to slow down. Um, and, and the reason that I think about that is that I think that one of the things that all of our institutions, whether it's an exhibition or you know, an English professor, uh, which I am by training, um, is finding a way to slow down um, and, um, and actually saying there's something here that, that I need someone to help me translate. Um, I need an artist or a curator to help me translate this work of art. Um, and sometimes there are things in the uh, registrative language that I tend to work with um, th that I need to translate and um, to be in company like this to say, is this translatable into each other's idioms? Right? Is, there, is there something that we can actually do, something that we can learn from each other? It doesn't always work. Um, and maybe it connects the last part of what is the museum for? Uh, and that comes from uh, the title of an essay um, um, by the South African historian Premesh Lalu, who wrote a, a really important essay a few years ago called What is the University for? And he was writing it during the um, Fees Must Fall, Roads Must Fall, Decolonizing the University Movement. And uh, the question behind it is dual. What is the university for enduringly, but is it willing to say that it's for something? And the idea of the university is that it is for, or it has been, the enlightened idea of the university is that it's for the open, the free exchange of knowledge on the condition that it doesn't take a position on any particular thing. And part of what I wanted to think is, are we at a moment in which the university has to articulate what it's for? It's for the climate. It's for the planet. It's for forms of justice. And, and it was just a translation of that. What, how would you think about, and I, in my understanding of this project, is that this project of one of, of saying it is not enough simply to inherit the museum, but to ask what the museum is, uh, what the museum is for. Um, so I'll pause there. Thank you. Um, I'll just respond quickly. I think Ian already responded very eloquently to the question. I appreciate it. I mean, I certainly do not try to be incomprehensible. Um, and I teach, so I, I, I do have to get my ideas across. So I'm sorry if they were not clear. It was my attempt to kind of actually think about how to materialize the violence that I see in my everyday research. I'm not up in the abstract. I do empirical ethnographic work. I've worked, I've gone to these borders, I've gone to the border walls, I've worked with migrants who've crossed, who've crossed undocumented and so on. So it's not abstract. So I'm sorry it came across that way. My idea was how do I materialize the violence that I see every day when I'm working with people into objects or things that people could see and engage in in the museum in ways that are also, as we talked, talked about yesterday, evoke violence without reproducing violence and trauma. So, um, so that was an attempt, was to go from a wire wall to kind of challenges through artistic medium to, and I think maybe the, the part that was the most difficult was the imagining of biomia. That I have to say, I did with curators and artists and designers. We came up to think about how could you think about the world differently in a concrete way that links to materiality, our biologies. So I'm, you know, that might be um, where it seemed abstract, and it is hard to get that across in a short bit of time. Um, but I think the goal there was to say there needs to be a space to imagine other ways of being in the world. And I'm, I agree with Ian on this. That's difficult. Imagination is always pushes us beyond the point of poetry of anything is to push us beyond the grammars we're familiar with. So it has to be slightly incomprehensible if you're going to disturb the concepts that we already work with. So that was my goal, was to disturb some of those concepts. But obviously it was not successful in the way I'd hoped. I'm sorry, yeah, this would be where my main, I'm, I, I understand, it's not that I don't understand what you're saying, or uh, that's not the point, but yeah, but can we move beyond this kind, looking at these issues which are actually very pressing, very material, very real issues, kind of go beyond looking at it as sort of 
ways in which we can, you know, think through in a literary aesthetic. Um, I, I see. I, I, yeah. I think Thank that, you. I think that that your point is 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 valid, and I think uh, um, both Ian and and Miriam have, have answered. The, the conference is structured, and we move after this session into four sessions of workshopping. So the conference also has the workshopping part of it. But I will go ahead and say again, but that for taking care, the project, the problem of the museum is a <laughs> conceptual problem. It is not just a practical problem. So one, the problem of the museum is the very conceptual architecture which we mobilize over and over again. We keep saying source community, lovely word, without understanding that source community has a conceptual struggle in it that is racialized, that is problematized. And therefore, the, the idea behind this conference is to both deal with the conceptual infrastructure with which we each struggle, as well as the pragmatic infrastructure. And we do not see those as different infrastructures. That's why we have artists, scholars, as well as workshops. Barbara, Peter, and then Barbara, and then we have to end because Esme says lunch is no. So Peter first, and then Barbara, and then we. I'll, I'll try to question, be very brief. Yes, um, th and thank you so much for, for, for bringing up these different perspectives and making me think again uh, uh, about the future. Uh, and, and again, in relation to science fiction, which would then brings a whole train of thoughts. Uh, I would like to quote Wayne oh, yeah. uh, late, earlier this week when he avoided the word innovative and replaced it with important. Um, and that is part of my question. Uh, you, you've all been focusing on futures... Uh, and trying to formulate new ones. And if I think of science fiction in that connection, then obviously there's a lot of pollution generated by that specific genre. But uh, there are good reasons for saying that it begins with a book that is actually about care. Uh, and that's uh, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Uh, because the real monster in Frankenstein is Dr. Frankenstein and not the monster itself. Um, and that is because he represents what I would like to call the, um, the, the, the enslavement to the future that modern people have called out over themselves, right? In the sense of fashion, in the sense of the art industry, in the sense of the academy constantly having to produce the new uh, and therefore being, being addicted to a kind of futurism that it itself could be seen as a metaphor for uh, pollution, waste uh, and, dis and destroying the planet. Uh, so my question is how do, you, how do you feel your future relates to that modern addiction? All right, brilliant. Barbara? and we take them all together. Well, I don't have a question. I just wanted to add to the discussion before that uh, if we do not um, theoreticize in a conference like this, which is the whole idea of coming together and um, translating it in our work, I mean, then we fail, right? That's the idea of the whole getting together here. And so I just wanted to say right. that. Brilliant. Well, well, because you said that, thank you, Barbara, there's a question at, right at the side. And I'll, but it has to be really short, because Esme, where is Esme? Sorry. <laughs> um, um, yeah, yeah, I was just going back to it. And the way you were mentioning about uh, that you're doing a movie, an indigenous movie right now, being in Edinburgh. So I was very curious about well, if you could share more about the process of, of, of this, yeah. All right. This, uh, this uh, yeah, that, about doing it in another place. And, 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 and to tie with Peter, Peter Pels's question, there's the, 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 the um, contemporary Dutch artist, Charles Langflu, in a conference two weeks ago, he says, there is a fascination with Afrofuturism. 
but I'm right now interested in a kind of Afro-Noism because I want to know <laughs> what we're going to do about this now that is, I'm struggling with. So I think that that's what you're also asking. All right, last answers and then we, um, we can go to now. Um, thank you so much for that question. I think it's a wonderful, really super important question about kind of constantly in search of the new or the emergent or the whatever. Um, and uh, so I, I take that seriously. And I guess what I would like to say is I think a lot of these, this work was not looking at the new, but at being attuned differently to what's around us. It's, it, that's part of our lives already. So for instance, for me, if it was the microbiome, that's a part of us and has been a part of us since we came into being. It's just being recognizing and acknowledging it. And similarly, I think of any of the kind of political work that for me that happens in relation to borders and border walls. Um, I, I talked very briefly, I said I had talked about commoning. For me, like people living in in a form of, of um, resource sharing, kind of non-private property arrangement is not something of the future. It's something that happens right now. Undocumented immigrants, lots of other folks, mutual aid, live together that way and it's just being attuned to it. So I think it's less about newness than about shifting our frame a little bit and being attuned to these kind of neglected things. Three very quick things on Afrofuturism and Afro Nowism. You know, there's this line um, from one of Sheila Mbembe's recent um, books um, that to consider the planetary is to becoming is to consider the becoming black of the planet. Um, and from that perspective, I think if you put those two things together, that the um, uh, Afrofuturism is a way of imagining the contemporary Afro now of the planet. Um, on um, I also appreciate the non-innovation um, piece. If you look at the description on the front web page of virtually every American university, and I'm not sure with about the European universities, they say what is their mission now, their mission statement. It's to solve global grand challenges for societal impact. <laughs> virtually every single one. <laughs> solve global grand challenges for societal impact. Right. I think we're going to use that in the museum as right. well. <laughs> that comes from the Grand Challenges paradigm from engineering. It doesn't mean it's ethically bankrupt, but it means that the language of engineering and datafication is governing the imagination of universities. And I think that one of our key tasks is to, is to speak from the arts and from museums and from the humanities, even though I have responsibility for the humanities now, and to find a different language. And the, the language that I have found useful is the language of the urgent and to try to think about the difference between the challenge and the urgent. Uh, and I'll just pause on that, happy to say more. Um, what it might mean to have, imagine a degrowth university economy is also an interesting one, so I'll just leave it there. Um, yes, about futurisms. Well, it's interesting because on one hand, I think every time I make a film, it's going to create a bunch of pollution. I mean, it's unavoidable, so um, yes, every new film is a problem, but then again, there are stories that are not being told, and I do think I want to tell them. So yes, that's the reason to make new films. Um, and on the other hand, the approach for both uh, Kim Chen Dutsa and Ituninu, the film that I'm working on, although the new film is about the future, the approach is not innovative at all. So we're working with a camera that uses lenses from the 70s, uh, I'm self-shooting like uh, a lot of filmmakers did in the 70s uh, and I'm using practices like walking which is not new at all. <laughs> so uh, I think although the representational and mimetic and narrative are all set in the future, the practical approach is very uh, artisanal. So uh, I'm interested in that uh, tension between those two. And the reason to work in the future is that, to be honest, I was starting to get a little bit bored with always having to make films about traditions and about indigenous people's past. So I thought if I'm going to continue doing that, I also need to start thinking about the future. And I think indigenous peoples particularly, but the global south maybe in general, are often thought of as being stuck in time and living in a past and artisanal, um, practices are often thought of as something of the past. So I, I wanted to combine that. So there's a little bit of future and a little bit of artisanal pastness. Yes, thank you. 
All right, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for a wonderful session. And it actually came to me during all of your presentation, but also yesterday, that the, the desire or the attendance, attunement to the future is not necessarily a practice of escapism, but a practice of responsibility. <laughs> and that is exactly where we are. How can we be responsible for not only what futures are possible out there, but also now, as well as fashioning the different kinds of future that we'd like. Thanks again, and we'll see you after lunch, which is one hour. Right? Um,